Hello, welcome to another episode of Jim's Allotment Garden. It's the 20th of December today, it's 12 degrees so we can get cracking with some stuff. Um, so what I'm going to do is start with the um, strawberries and I'll do some questions and uh, I might even get onto some digging today. So welcome to another episode of Jim's Allotment Garden. So as you can see, here's the strawberry patch. I've taken off the um, the frames that go over the top. So this is basically the uh, the strawberry patch as it's um, got to today. And you can see a lot of the leaves have now sort of started to die off. So all the plants have had all the nutrition they possibly can do from the sunlight, etc. So if I take all the leaves off here, the plants aren't going to suffer for it. And I'll, I just thought I'd quickly start with a note just to show you actually how I made this. So basically what I've got is uh, this is, um, it's about 9 foot by about 15 foot or possibly 10 foot um, and all the strawberries are contained within here. Up the middle I've got a, um, there's some black, black mat under here which is the weed suppressant and then in the middle I've got some um, tiles, some, some roof tiles, you know the thick, um, these tiles here, so they're the thick um, concrete sort of pantel type tiles. Um, and that's just, just to hold the uh, the black um, weed suppressing membrane down more than anything. And then the plants are planted through that into the ground. And then just up the middle here I've got a, um, a plank to, to walk on. So I can walk on here during the, uh, the summer months. Um, so I know I'm not treading on any plants or anything like that. And then round the edge um, I've just got some old um, basically fence posts. Now, if you put wood down on the ground like this, it is likely to uh, become rotten or, or whatever. So what I've actually done is, I don't know if you can see, but there's a gap underneath the, um, the board there all the way around where I've got a row of bricks running all the way around so it raises it up off the ground. And then, I don't know if you can see, but it's actually up off the ground. So, um, you know, so it's not sitting in moisture, which is obviously what, what's going to send your wood, um, wood rotten. So, what I will be doing when it's dry enough in the spring, I shan't do it now because it's too wet, but what I will do is go around with some fence paint and paint all of these. Um, they have already been uh, pressure treated, but, um, but you know, I'll uh, just, just to tidy them up and uh, get them tidy again, I shall uh, paint them up with some fence paint in the spring. So, basically what I'm going to do now is just basically pull off all of the old... Um, all of the old um, leaves and shoots and runners and etc. Bob them in a, um, a tub or your wheelbarrow or whatever and don't try to compost them, burn them because if you can see this um, you see this leaf here, this um, this sort of brownie mark on it mark on that one there as well, that's actually a disease so basically what you want to do is get rid of all of this dead material because that'll um, basically bring disease in next year if you, if you put it anywhere near um, potatoes, tomatoes, or strawberries, or anything like that. It'll, um, you know, it'll, it'll transfer the disease again back into there. So, basically, what I'll be doing is fetching all of this off, drying it off, so it, it'll uh, burn easily. And um, then what I'll do is I'll, I'll put it in the incinerator and burn it to, um, to kill it all off. So I'm going to put it in this pot and probably some other pots as well. Uh, these, these tubs, sorry. And I'll um, put that in the shed for a couple of weeks just to dry off, so I know it'll burn all right. Um, and then I'll um, bob it in the incinerator and burn it. So, to get all of this sort of dead material off, all you really need is a trusty pair of scissors, not particularly um, big scissors, but uh, sharp nevertheless. Um, but to be honest with you, the majority of it, you'll be able to pull off with your hands without any tools. So, um, so I'll show you that now. Okay, so I'll, I'll do this bit here, and basically all you need to be doing is sort of, with your hands like a, like a claw or a rake or whatever, just pull out all of the sort of dead material like that, all the runners. And what you might need to do is as you get to a plant there, just chop off 
any of the um, stalks and then all of this material pull it all back so you've basically pulling all the material off so all you've got left is basically the black plastic um, and any of the uh, sort of shoots etc that, um, that may be coming off there so basically you're just kind of snipping away and so all of this sort of material put it in your tub now what you might find is the odd plant is, um, has actually died um, you may get the odd one like that so what I suggest you do is if you do find any positions in your um, um, cloth that, where you've got a, um, a hole, basically get one of the runners. So I'll, I'll just bring this up a bit closer to the camera. So what I've got here is a strawberry runner. Um, and what I've done is I've just cut off the, um, just the old leaves. And you can see there's the root system there. So if you just bob that in the ground, um, that will make a, a plant next year. The other thing you can do is bob that in a plant pot with some compost in your greenhouse. Let that grow in the greenhouse over winter and um, you'll have another strawberry plant for next year and just bob that in in the spring where you've got any missing. But um, I'll basically carry on going through the, uh, the strawberry bed, pulling out all the leaves um, in any of the runners, anything like this. So all of this kind of stuff you want to be pulling off um, for burning. So just go around and do this like that, pull out any weeds, anything like that that you don't, uh, that you don't want and then all that, that can go all into the incinerator um, in a few weeks time when it's all dried out. Okay so there's the, uh, the finished bed, as you can see I've taken quite a lot of um, stuff out, I've taken basically all of that. Now as I say I'll put that in the shed to dry off, but the main reason for doing this th at this time of year, because you can you can cut your strawberries down either now at the end of the season or you can do it sort of February, March time next year. The reason I do it at this time of year is because underneath, I don't know if you can see, but underneath the uh, underneath all, all of that sort of leaves and stuff, it's quite damp and it's a, it's a breeding ground for slugs and uh, snails and stuff to be honest with you. So the reason I do it now is obviously if I've got a load of slugs in here uh, they're going to be laying eggs and stuff into the ground and then they're going to obviously hatch out next year and then those are the slugs that are going to be eating your strawberries. So the reason I do it now is to keep the ground dry so that no slugs get on there and start laying eggs etc. So if you do it this time of year I always feel it's better for um, a slug control purposes but if it is where you live a little bit colder than it is here and um, you can't get out because of the weather or whatever don't worry you can do what I've just done here right up until um, sort of February, March next year. Now what I will be doing is obviously this is just a real rough go over um, to get all of the old sort of dead material out and as you can see there are still bits in there. What I will be doing is um, either um, sort of January, February time what I will be doing is going through and just having a second tidy up before I put the uh, before I put the, uh, the fertiliser on etc for next year. So uh, but for now that's most certainly going to stop the slugs and the snails getting in there and um, laying eggs and stuff for next year. Okay so question time, the, uh, the first question this week is from um, Mark Davison and he's asked about uh, what you do when you're introducing chickens to um, you know some you know when you've already got your own chickens. So the one thing that you need to um, think about when you're putting chickens in is you need to introduce them slowly. Chickens can be a little bit um, can be a little bit brutal really, they can sort of attack each other and it's where the term pecking order comes from because chickens will sort of fight amongst themselves until there's a, you know, some kind of hierarchy um, you know, within, the, uh, within the chicken. So what you need to do is um, first of all you need to um, corner off a section within the run or in the coop um, so you can put the new chickens in there so they can see um, each other but they can't get at each other, that's the best thing I can suggest. You need to do this for about four to um, four days to a week, um, and then as soon as you've done that, um, what I normally do is then let them out onto the lawn so they can have the run of the lawn, and then let all both the new and the, um, the you know the existing chickens out and let them sort of get to know each other whilst they've got plenty of space. Um, if you do sort of put them in together to start with, they will always be a bit of fighting, even even if you do what I've just suggested. There'll always be a little bit of fighting whilst they're 
establishing the new packing order. It's a lot easier to introduce some breeds than others, um, and that and that very much uh, depends on the breed. I've personally found that um, chickens that are um, darker feathered, so the you know the sort of the darker browns or the black feathers, they tend to be a little bit more. Um, um, sort of territorial and, uh, and uh, a little bit more brutal so um, however having said that I have had problems with lighter brown chickens as well so I think it depends on you know the um, basically how much room they've got and um, obviously try to give them as much room as you possibly can do uh, when you first introduce them and uh, within a few days irrespective of what you do they will settle down and um, you know they'll sort of get to know each other and the new packing order will be established and then it'll be like you've um, you know like they've always been there so but, but what I suggest is uh, you know as I say put a um, a cornered off section in, in, in your um, checking coop put them in there let them um, see each other and uh, sort of get to know each other if you like whilst they're separated as soon as you've um, done that for four to you know four weeks to um, four days to a week then mix them up and just let them get on with it. If there are any cuts or, or anything like that, um, the one thing you need to be careful of with chickens is they, they see colour um, more so than you know more so than we do. Their eyesight is quite different to ours. So if there is anything that's red, it will be like a uh, like a red uh, red ragged to bull sort of thing. So if there are any cuts whilst they've been squabbling, then do um, sort of put some Vaseline on that to you know to stem the bleeding. Don't be too, don't be too concerned about that. This is this is a very natural thing, um, and uh, just 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 let them get on with it, and I'm sure you'll be fine. Make sure there's plenty of water and um, drink as well. But here's a video that um, I I uh, made yesterday, and this is of um, I'm going I'm going to be putting some chickens in in uh, with mine in the next um, uh, couple of weeks. Um, so I've prepared the run already for those. So here's a quick video on that. Okay, so when you're introducing. Um new chickens into your um, your chicken nut or whatever what you need to be doing is making a an area where you can put the new chickens and they can see um, your existing chickens but the two groups can't get at each other because you can get a little bit of fighting so what I always do is um, I build a second little um, sort of enclosure here and obviously dependent on your um, your run or whatever you've got um, you know, you may need to extend it slightly or whatever to do it, but I'll be introducing, uh, in the next week or so, I'll be introducing another um, four chickens into here. So what I'll be doing is making a, an area here which is going to be just short of sort of two metres squared and I'm going to be taking it up to kind of this level here. So it's just basically a box inside um, the existing one, so I shall do that now. So to make this temporary enclosure, all I'm going to be doing is, and it is a temporary enclosure because you only really need to have this in the, the chicken run for a few days, is I'm just getting the, uh, the straw out of the way that's in here at the moment. And you can, it's ideal to do this when you're changing the straw, but because I only changed it last week, um, I'm not going to change the straw because this is pretty fresh as it is. But the reason for doing that is you want the chickens to um, sort of smell the same as each other. So, if you if you change the chickens' um, straw over and everything, then obviously your new ones and your your old ones are going to stay the same. Now, all I'm going to be using is this is just some uh, some mesh, and these holes are about um, I don't know about three inches square. And all I'm going to be doing is tying um, tying this on to the uh, the framework in here like that. Because basically, as long as a chicken can't get through, it ain't going to make any difference. You know, you don't need fine mesh to do this. But I'm just going to be tying this on to the um, to the grills here, and then just to here, and then to go back to um, to there. So that's that's basically going to be the size of it. And there you go. So that's all it needs to be. So it's uh, all I've done is just made a box with the with the wire. I don't know if you can see it. Um, I've put a bit of wood in. On the edge of it here, if I come this way, you might be able to see it a bit better. So there's a piece of wood here, which is just, and that's more than sturdy enough. Obviously, the chickens will go in this bit here, and then this will, uh, this bit here will close down. So there you go. That's with the uh, the lid on, and basically, uh, all you'll need to do is just lift that up and put that in. Now inside there, obviously, what I'll need to do is put some kind of roosting bar. So I'll just put another piece of wood like this one in there, so they can, like the they've got that one there. 
so there'll be another roosting bar in there. Um, I shall put that small um, feeder in full of food and I'll be putting the um, the other watering tub in there as well so they've got food and water um, separate. And whilst you're doing this you most certainly need to make sure that both sets of chickens have got more than enough food and water so um, you know they don't feel like they need to compete for food. Okay the next question comes from um, is I think it's pronounced is um, and she's been asking about um, onions and basically she's had a problem with not um, um, growing onions uh, particularly well. And the thing that I find with onions is over the years um, I've had some bad crops of onions and the thing that I've found uh, or, the, or the tips that I can give you um, uh, to grow onions the best. The first thing is ground preparation. Onions are a very greedy um, vegetable. So what you need to do is make sure you get plenty of organic material in there because they because they need lots of water to grow properly, and that's normally the key to it. Water is normally the key to onions, so make sure your onion don't go dry. Obviously, if you let them go dry, then there is a dry period; they can run to seed. So obviously, you want to avoid that anyway. But with onions, you want to keep the ground wet all the time. So always plant onions in a in a part of your allotment which is wet. Uh, not not too wet. You don't want them sitting in water, but you want them to have you know sort of plenty of water to get at. And with onions, what you want to do is for them to establish the roots quickly into the ground. So, if we start at the beginning, dig plenty of organic material into the ground, straw, muck, whatever you can um, uh, put. It's not necessarily fertilizer you put in the ground. It's organic material, so it holds the moisture. As soon as you've done that. Um, a normally um, balanced fertiliser will do for um, 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 for onions. What I do tend to do is put coffee in the ground uh, where I'm putting onions because that will enrich not only the nitrogen but you'll also have the phosphogen etc which the onions are needing. But if you put a general um, purpose fertiliser in there that will be more than sufficient. Um, the next key is to dig the ground thoroughly and you want to break the ground up into as far as um, tilt as you possibly can do so the ground's nice and fluffy. The reason you're doing this is you want the, the ground to be loose so that the onion can establish its roots into the ground and get all that moisture that it needs. As soon as you've done that, the next trick is don't push the onion into the ground. What you need to do is be getting the, um, the, onion, uh, uh, the small onion set with a trowel Dig a hole, don't push your finger into the ground because what you're doing is by doing that is you're compacting the ground underneath the, uh, the onion which is where the roots need to go to form so you want the ground to be loose there. So what you need to do is put your trowel in and pull the ground back so you've made a hole with loose soil at the bottom. Plant the, um, plant the onion set in the hole and I would, I would suggest you plant the onion set probably two to three inches below the ground so that you can't actually see it once it's in the ground. Uh, the reason you're doing this is to stop the birds pulling it out because if you if you leave the little stalk out of the onion uh, the birds will come along and think it's a worm and pull the onions out for you so you don't want that. So dig the ground, put the onion in, cover the onion over and then give them a really good watering. As soon as you've watered them then leave them obviously they will come up and as they, as they form you'll find that the ground will then start to compact as the uh, you know, as, as sort of time goes on, and the, oil, the, the onion will appear at the top of the ground. So don't worry that you're burying it too um, too far under the ground, because because the ground's loose, the ground will then um, sort of drop around it, and then the onion will basically come up to the top. Um, keep them watered all through the year, um, as I put in my comment um, on the on the previous video. La this year we had a reasonably dry year, and I was watering my onions probably two or three times a week and what I will do is put the sprinkler on, you know the normal um, watering sprinkler, put that in the middle of the onions and leave the, the leave the hose pipe on for sort of 20 minutes and give them a really good soak. You don't need to put vast amounts of water on because the, uh, the, the roots of an onion are really no deeper than six inches in the ground so you only need to sort of penetrate through to six inches so you don't need to put loads and loads and loads of water on. But the same with everything else in allotment. It's better to do little and often than, than you know the sort of one-month blast. So come up every couple of days if it hasn't been raining and give them some water. If you are watering with uh, watering cans, I would suggest on an area um, maybe um, 10 foot by 3 foot, you need to be putting at least one watering can on there um, every sort of two to three days 
whilst it's dry because you want the onions to establish. As soon as they've established and if you've got plenty of um, organic material in the ground you won't need to water as much so this is why this is where it pays dividends. If you can get as much straw and organic material into the ground, paper, cardboard, anything like that, um, leaf mulch or anything like that that, that that will hold the moisture in the ground then that will basically enable you to water them less because the, because the moisture will be in the ground. The one thing I can also suggest is if you have got leaf mulch, um, you can um, mulch the onions as well. So that, that will also keep the moisture in the ground and, and, and make them form bigger um, that, you know, than they would do normally. That's the best advice I can give you to get your yield up with the onions. Uh, the one question that was asked as well is um, you, um, some um, wooden cuttings and that have been burnt there. Um, in the year before. Now um, wood ash is good for pretty much anything. It's particularly good for anything that's a root that you want to grow um, roots. So anything like potatoes, parsnips, carrots, anything like that. Ash is really good um, because it's got the nutrients in there for, you know, to form the roots. Um, if you grow onions on a piece of ground where you've had ash, it's not going to do the, uh, the onions any harm at all. In fact, it, it'll, it'll do them a lot of good. So um, it's not the ash. I'm, I'm sure what it would be is you need to dig the ground, get it nice and loose so the onion can establish itself, bury the onion an inch, um, sort of two or three inches down, and give them plenty of water and keep them watered. Um, that's the best advice I can give you. Finally, um, I was asked a question. What... What would you um, what would you not grow again in 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 the garden or the allotment that you've grown in the past? And uh, I've I've thought about this a lot. There's and there's, there's there's three kind of reasons that I wouldn't grow something again. One because we just didn't eat it. Secondly because it's cheaper to get it in the shop. And thirdly because it's difficult to grow. And if it's difficult to grow, there's no point you know sort of um, trying to. Um, you know, sort of slave way trying to get something to grow properly if we haven't got the conditions in the UK to grow them properly. So the first, what falls into the first category, things that I wouldn't go again because basically we didn't eat it, um, Jerusalem artichokes, um, I grew a load of once and we just didn't eat them, we didn't like them so I, I have, have never grown them again. However, as I, uh, you know, what I put in the note, um, some people will like them, some people won't, you know, you've got to grow what you're personally going to eat. Um, so that, you know, what I don't like isn't necessarily what you won't like, so try them. If you don't like them, don't grow them again. But I shan't be growing traditional my checks again, I just didn't like them. Um, the second thing that I wouldn't grow again is some herbs. I, I, um, I went all out probably about 20 years ago and I grew practically every herb I could get my hands on. And I grew them really well and they, they all grew well. But it's nice to have a herb garden because of the smell and the scent and all the rest of it. But in the allotment, I only grow things that I'm going to use in cooking or eating, you know, you, you know. so um, I I haven't grown probably 20 or 30 of the uh, varieties of, of herbs again because I just didn't use them. Uh, I can't remember the, uh, the names off the top of my head, but basically what I grow are things that I use um, in spaghettis and things like that. So all the, like the Italian and the um, sort of the Spanish herbs, so things like uh, oregano, thyme, um, rosemary, uh, things like that that they use in spaghetti. And I also use stuff that we use in more traditional um, sort of British cooking like mint, balm, um, sage. Um, those are the kind of herbs that I grow. Now next year I will be growing a few more herbs than, um, than I did do this year, but those are basically uh, the herbs that I grow. Obviously chives can be considered to be a bit of a herb. Um, I grow them for, you know, for salads and uh, potato salads and things like that. But um, those are the herbs that I grow. There are, there are a load of other herbs that uh, that I've grown before, things like borage, um, that I just wouldn't wouldn't bother again because I just don't use them in the cooking. The second category are things that I've grown in the past. I've had reasonably good yields, but it, it, you just put that much in that um, it, it, it's cheaper to buy them in the shop. And the thing that falls into this category is garlic. Now, I bought these garlic uh, the other day. Um, from um, I actually bought these from Costco, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven big bulbs there. As you can see, you can see the size of them. They were two pound um, to um, to buy, and really, it just isn't worth growing garlic, I don't think, because these are these are actually grown in England. These are grown down in um, down in um, Kent, and um, I honestly feel. 
I've, I've, I've grown a variety of garlic, I've grown elephant garlic and I've grown uh, normal garlic and if you think that the, the actual garlic bulbs that you buy from the shop to put in the ground are probably uh, £3 and then you've got to prepare the ground, you've got to put your fertiliser in, you've got to do da 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 and you've got to water them and all the rest of it. Um, it just isn't worth it because you can buy them for £2 and these are really good quality garlic uh, bulbs and it, it just isn't worth growing. So that's, that's one that I wouldn't grow again because it just isn't worth it. Um, carrots kind of fall into that category as well. I always do grow carrots just for the novelty. You know, I grow the novelty type carrots. But if you think a big bag of carrots, you can buy for a pound. And, and if you sort of weight up against how much time you spend digging the ground, planting it and all the rest of it, it just ain't worth growing them. Um, so I grow carrots because I like, you, you know, to grow them and I like to grow the unusual varieties. But if I was to grow carrots for the family, uh, the amount of carrots that we eat, I would probably grow five or six times the amount that I grow. And um, if you add up the, the cost of the seed and the, uh, the time and effort that it takes you to grow them and the potential um, of, of you losing the crop, because there are a lot of things that can go wrong with carrots. Uh, you know, if the, if the ground's slightly rocky, then, um, you know, you can get them split and stuff like that. So carrots are another one that are kind of borderline. I do grow them, but really, if you think about it, the cost of buying carrots in a shop, really, you know, it's a no-brainer and you think, well, I can go, you know, buy a big bag of carrots for a pound. It's not really worth growing. Um, however, having said that, your own vegetables always taste better, I think. And obviously, if you're growing organically, most certainly, um, you know, it, it's worth growing from that uh, perspective. I grow them organically, uh, but I do buy a lot of carrots from the shops as well. The third category, so we've done things that I would have um, not bothered again because we just don't eat them. Um, things that... Um, that are cheaper to buy in the shop. The third things that I've found that are difficult to grow, um, and I've found in the past things like asparagus, that's quite difficult to grow. As soon as they got established, um, they're, um, you know, they're easy, you know, you just leave them to it in the way because obviously they're a perennial vegetable. Um, but when you think you've got to invest a reasonable amount of time in, in um, in asparagus because if you grow it from seed like I did it's going to take you four years before you can have four to five years before you can actually crop off the off the plants uh, you know with any amount having said that asparagus is incredibly expensive to buy in the shops so if you look at it from a cost point of view it's well worth your growing and it's not a particularly difficult vegetable to grow but it is um, but it is you know it takes you a long time to establish it um, you know, before you can start to crop it. So it's a reasonable amount of time and effort before you can actually reap any of the rewards. Um, I have grown um, a number of asparagus plants and my ground does get a little bit wet for it, to be honest with you. And I have had quite a few plants that have sort of died off. To start with, I bought actual plants and planted them. They all died off. These ones that I've got now are a different variety which I've grown from seed. So over the last six years, I've had a number of attempts at growing asparagus. It's growing well now, but I haven't eaten any asparagus off this allotment yet. So that, that, that kind of puts it into perspective. I, you know, I've been trying to grow for six years and actually crop nothing. So um, that's, that's perhaps one that's, um, that's uh, a little bit difficult. But I would suggest you try it, because if you've got a bit of ground where you can grow it, like I've got by the greenhouse behind me here, um, then uh, it's well worth growing. Okay, final couple of tips of the week. Um, I know I keep stressing this, but I, I can't um, sort of say this enough. With, a, with an allotment, you've got to realise is, is what you put into the ground is what you get out. So um, I cannot um, stress enough, get as much organic material, um, compost, and anything that you can get your hands on for nothing or, or, or very little, get that in the ground now for over the winter. Um, things like um, coffee grounds you can get for nothing, as I've explained before or um, any, um, any, any sort of um, leaves that are lying about, to compost them and, and get them into your ground. Every year you're taking stuff out of the ground, obviously you're growing vegetables and you're taking all that nutrient out of the ground. What you need to do is at least replace what you've taken out of the ground, um, otherwise your ground, be, uh, you know, all the nutrition is going to go out of your ground. So just a quick note in, anything that you can think of that you can recycle, rot down and put into the ground, um, 
it's it, it's well worth doing and that means everything from you know in everybody's household there is stuff that you can recycle and put into the ground from paper cardboard um, anything that's uh, any sort of old egg boxes or anything like that that'll all, all sort of rot down eggshells uh, put them in the ground um, anything any any vegetable matter of course any um, grass cuttings or anything like that only put into your green bin for recycling stuff that's got seeds in it that you know if you're going to put that back in the ground you're going to get loads of weeds anything other than that get it back in the ground dig it in let it rot over the uh, the winter and um, you know next year you'll you, you know you'll reap the benefits just by putting compost into the ground you can double the yield of whatever vegetables you're putting in there with, without any uh, you know without any other thought of that um, you know just literally by digging a load of stuff into the ground you plant your stuff in there and you if you compare the vegetables that you've grown in that ground with the you know the composting or, or whatever you can put in there compared to a piece of ground where you've literally done nothing but dig it the yield you will you almost certainly see the difference if you have an experiment and you know sort of compare them to the second tip I would say this week is um, the shops are competing at the minute with it being Christmas time. It is most certainly a good time to get bargains. If you go to any of the supermarkets and stuff like that, there's going to be a lot of um, sort of tools, um, secateurs, trowels, and anything like that. This is the time of year to get them. Um, you know, they'll be cheaper. Most certainly in January, um, in the sales, there's going to be a load of stuff. So if there's anything that you need for your garden in the coming um, year, um, from a tools uh, perspective or wellies or gloves or anything like that now is the time to get them because they most certainly will be cheap in the shop if not now in most certainly in the next couple of weeks well thank you for watching this episode of Jim's Allotment Garden I hope it's been of some use to you it's Christmas time in the next couple of days so uh, I just wanted to take this opportunity to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year and of course that only comes from me it comes from the chickens and the dogs and everybody else so I just wanted to say thank you for watching Thank you for all the comments that uh, you've given me over the last few months. And uh, there'll be plenty more coming in the new year. I'll put out one more episode um, this year, which will explain anything that I've been doing up here in the next sort of week or so. And also having a quick look back of um, some of the successes, some of the things that didn't go too well. But, uh, you know, this, it's always a mixed bag with a lot, but you never know what's going to go on because of the weather and stuff. But... Um, Thank you again to everybody out there um, and I shall be uh, seeing you again in the new year with lots of other stuff to talk about um, on the allotments etc. So thank you very much indeed and happy new year. Bye bye now. Bye bye.